We like to feed on our thoughts, which is why we feed them. We gain entertainment from them, we gain help with our occupation in life, especially if we're employed in a job that rewards thinking. We just keep feeding, feeding, feeding our thoughts. But as the Buddha noted, our thoughts turn around and feed on us. We think we're getting the better part of the deal. We feed them, they give us nourishment one kind or another. We tend not to notice how much they're eating away at us. Or we notice the eating away, but we don't make the connection. And often the th thoughts that we feed on cause us a lot of trouble. And if we're not discerning, we just take down, gobble down everything that the mind churns up, identify it as my thought, and I've got to do something with it. Sometimes, sometimes we get stuck with it, and yet then we turn around and keep feeding them. It's as if we had some chickens. We feed them so they give us eggs, but it turns out they don't produce only eggs. They produce chicken shit, and we don't know which is which, and so we just gobble down everything that comes out of the chickens. And it turns out they're also the chickens from hell. They come and peck at us when we're not aware of it like the birds in that Hitchcock film. The problem is we don't make the connection, and so we keep on feeding the chickens. It's one of the purposes of getting the mind into concentration is so we can step back from the whole process and begin to see it as it's happening. And one of the reasons we have to get the mind into concentration to do this is so that we give the mind an alternative place to feed. When the Buddha provides analogies for different parts of the path, concentration is almost always the food. The first jhana is grass, that fourth jhana is ghee and honey and all those good things. Because if the mind doesn't have something good to feed on, it's going to feed on whatever it can get. As the Buddha said, if you don't have a pleasure that's apart from sensuality, then no matter how much you understand the drawbacks of sensuality, you're going to go back and nibble on it in secret. So try to develop a sense of ease and well-being with the breath. We talked today about rapture. That's actually the food of the concentration when you're really hungry. Pleasure is the kind of food for when you're not quite so hungry. And equanimity is the, <clears throat> is the feeling that you have when everything is satisfied. The different parts of the body that have been lacking energy have their energy supplied. And you don't have to keep gobbling things down. So try to get a sense of well-being. Notice how you breathe, what the sensitive parts of the body in the breathing process. When you breathe in, what's the part that gets satisfied? What are the, part that you're, what are the parts that you're trying to satisfy as you breathe in? If you begin to notice that, then you can provide yourself with a sense of well-being very easily. Just go straight to those parts. And then when they're satisfied, those are the obvious ones, and try to notice which ones are not so obvious. It's as if you're sending food to different parts of the body, and then you feed first the ones that are clamoring the most, and then you try to spread the nourishment around. As you're doing this, thoughts will come up that are not related to the concentration. Then remind yourself, it's inevitable they'll come up, but it's not inevitable that you run with them. to make the distinction between old karma and new karma. The old karma is the fact that you have these habits. You've learned this language, you've learned this way of talking to yourself. And it's only natural that the mind just keeps churning out the same old stuff. But the question of whether to believe it, whether to run with it, whether to accept it, 
That's new karma. So as soon as you're aware of the fact that you've started running with these thoughts, drop them. That's a skillful action right there. And no matter how many times it takes, it's a habit you've got to learn how to develop. Think about all the many lifetimes you've spent just learning how to think, learning how to master human language, and enjoying the results, feeding off the results. Now you've got to learn a new habit, and it's going to take time. This is why patience is so important in the practice. This goes against the grain. We like to think. We like to talk to ourselves. That's one of the ways the mind feeds. So you're giving it new feeding habits. And it takes a while for it to get used to the new habits. So patience. And learn how to keep encouraging yourself. These are some of the skills that we tend to not learn, especially in our educational system, which channels everybody into areas where they're talented. If you're not talented at pulling yourself out of your thoughts, especially if you have been talented about thinking, it's going to take a while to see that there's a talent in not thinking and actually like it. So it requires patience and it requires a kind of bounce-back attitude that no matter how many times you have to keep coming back to your thoughts, you just keep doing it. You don't give up. And so the mind gets a better and better sense of ease and well-being with the breath. Then it's going to be easier to pull yourself out of the thoughts. And you begin to see that there are many stages in the formation of a thought, and there's many stages in that new karma that encourages a thought. And the quicker you are at recognizing the fact that the mind has slipped off and coming back, then the more you're going to see. Instead of hitting the thought at stage five, you start hitting it at stage four, and stage three, stage two, stage one, down to the point where it's just a little squirm of energy in the area where the mind and the body meet. And, and that squirm of energy, it's hard to say whether it's physical or mental. But if you slap the perception on and say, oh, this is a thought, and then it's a thought about the future, it's a thought about the past, it's a thought about this topic, that topic, and then you run with it. In the very beginning stages, you're going to be aware of the thought only when it's fully formed. But as you get better and better at zapping it in time, catching it when it's just a squirm of energy or a little stirring of energy, the more you see that there are different stages. It's like a product is being sent through the bureaucracy. The bureaucrat on this level puts a stamp on it, sends it to the next level. The next one puts a stamp on it, sends it up. See so if you can catch it when the moment the, the product appears. Then you're in a lot more control about what's going on. This applies not only to idle thoughts, but also to strong emotions. The problem with strong emotions is they take hold of the breath and zip right through the stages very quickly. So again, it requires that you work on this process while you're meditating, but also be alert to the fact that it's happening all day long. And especially with a strong emotion that we don't that you don't like, there's going to be a lot of denial around it. In other words, the first bureaucrat will put the stamp on and then pretend it didn't happen. It's like kids passing a note through a classroom. Pass it on the next person, then pretend you didn't do it. Pass it on the next person, pretend you didn't do it. And as long as you're willing to play along with the pretense, then you're going to be stuck with fully formed thoughts, fully formed emotions. But if you begin to sense, okay, this decision has been made, or that decision has been made, then you can nip it in the bud. And it's a lot easier to deal with. But all of this requires that you have an alternative source of food. Feed off the Directed thought and evaluation. Get interested in this issue of how do you make the breath energy really good? What is the breath energy? How do you sense 
when it's flowing well and when it's not flowing well. What ways of dealing with the breath improve your health? What ways wear you down? This is something you can study, because the breath can be medicine for the diseases of the body and the mind. It can help bring balance to a body that's out of balance, or bring balance to a mind that's out of balance. Because it's good nourishing food, a lot better than the chicken shit that we've been feeding off for so long. So regard this as learning new feeding habits, and you're going to be a lot better off with the new habits. And as for the chickens, you can let them starve. It's not that you won't be thinking anymore, but you've realized that you've been feeding way too many chickens. At the same time, you get more and more discerning about which chickens are the ones that are actually feeding on you. You can stop feeding those ones. And you get more discerning about what's the chicken shit and what are the chicken eggs. So when you have to think, you're eating only eggs. And as you get really good, you don't have to eat those either. They're there. And you find that the eggs have a lot of uses besides just eating them. You can fix food for other people. In the meantime, you've got the food of, the, of your concentration. You've got the food that comes from getting the mind to settle down with a sense of well-being, feeding all the parts of the body that need breath energy each time you breathe in, and letting that sense of being nourished spread out so it seems like it fills every cell in the body. And that pulls you out of the, the vicious cycle of feeding the chickens and having the chickens come back at night and peck at you. And ultimately, as the Buddha said, there comes a point where the mind doesn't need to feed anymore at all. The well-being of awakening, the well-being of release, is totally free from any need to depend on conditions. It's described as a state that's free from hunger, not because you've told yourself not to be hungry, but you've fully satisfied the mind. So that's where we're aiming. And it starts by learning new feeding habits. That'll get you on the healthy path.